Last term you saw this reaction where a diatomic halogen attacks an alkene. So to remind you of that mechanism, this is actually a complicated mechanism where the carbon-carbon pi bond, one of the carbons attacks the bromine at the same time as the bromine attacks this other carbon, and then this bromine is a leaving group. Here's the bromine that was the leaving group. And this forms a cyclic intermediate because this carbon is attacking the bromine. The left-hand carbon is attacking the bromine at the same time as this bromine is attacking the right-hand carbon. Okay. This is one of the reactions that I think you saw last term when you were studying alkenes. What about the charges? The charges here are harder than usual to figure out, but let's focus on this bromine here. Well, these two arrows cancel each other out. This arrow is bringing electrons into the bromine, and this arrow is taking electrons out from the bromine. So those two arrows would tend to cancel each other out. But then there's a third arrow that's, again, taking the electrons away from the bromine. So overall, the bromine is losing electrons. So the bromine should end up with a positive charge. Now we want to, by analogy, show the mechanism between a per acid and an alkene. This was just a review of a reaction you saw last term. Now we should see that what the mechanism is when this per acid attacks the alkene. By the way, what's going to be the product of this? What's going to be the product when the per acid attacks the alkene? And, and, uh, and epoxide. Yeah, an epoxide. We already know what the product is going to be. Now we just want to see what the mechanism is for that. Well, it turns out that it's kind of similar to this mechanism here. Can you see that this is a per acid? Because here we have the two oxygens bound to each other that give us that peroxy group. So this is just another way of writing a per acid. This per acid is the same as this per acid here. Well, here we had the left-hand carbon attacking the bromine at the same time as the bromine attacked the right-hand carbon. Well, in this case, we're going to have the left-hand oxygen. Sorry, the left-hand carbon attacking this oxygen at the same time as the oxygen attacks the right-hand carbon. This part of the mechanism, then, is very analogous to what we saw with bromine. <clears throat> That's great. We have to draw in a lone pair here to be at the tail of this arrow, because the oxygen doesn't have a charge. Okay. And then there's some other arrows that we need. We've basically already seen how we're going to form the epoxide. We've seen how we're forming the left-hand part of the ring with this arrow, and the right-hand part of the ring with this arrow. But also, we're going to have to detach the oxygen from these two bonds. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be an epoxide. So we can see how to do those detachments. Well, it turns out that this oxygen over here takes this hydrogen. Okay. That frees up the electrons in this bond. Let's draw this like this instead. Let's have the oxygen take its pi bond and use that to attack the hydrogen. I think that's a little bit more elegant. Okay. That frees up the electrons in this bond to form a new lone pair on the oxygen. Okay. And now we're seeing how we're going to detach the hydrogen on the right from the oxygen. And we also have to detach the oxygen on the left. Well, we can take the sigma bond and move those electrons over here. So just like we have a cycle of arrows underneath the oxygen, we also end up with a cycle of arrows on top of the oxygen. What are our products going to look like? Well, the most important product is the epoxide. This is the bond that was formed by this left-hand arrow, and here's the bond that was formed by the right-hand arrow.
is there going to be any charge on this oxygen? Well, notice that there are two arrows pointing towards this oxygen. This arrow is pointing towards the oxygen, and this arrow is pointing towards the oxygen. And there's also two arrows pointing away from the oxygen. This is pointing away from the oxygen, and this is pointing away from the oxygen. Two arrows pointing towards and two arrows pointing away means the charge shouldn't change. Since it started neutral, it's going to end up neutral. Well, that's good because epoxides are supposed to be neutral. So unlike when we form this bromonium, the cyclic ion, we're not going to end up with the charge. And then what are the bonds going to look like here for what remains of the per acid? Well, now this carbon will still be bonded to the oxygen, but only with the sigma bond. This oxygen is going to have a new sigma bond to this hydrogen. And this oxygen will have a double bond to this carbon. By the way, if you recall, this is what we said was the structure of a normal carboxylic acid. We can compare this and see this is just the structure of a carboxylic acid. It used to be a per oxy carboxylic acid, but now it's lost one of its oxygens. So now it's just a normal carboxylic acid. But the important product here is the epoxide. Usually we don't care very much about this product here. And this is all one step. This is all one concerted reaction. And of course, we know it would have been possible for the oxygen to also attack from below, which has the potential to maybe give you a different product. Although in this case, it would just give you the same product as we have here. Well, I thought it was important to go through this mechanism. He covered this in the notes here. And it's good to see how this is similar to this halogenation, bromination reaction we saw up here. It's possibly might be tested on this mechanism, so it's good to know. However, it doesn't really, I don't think, give us that much insight when we're solving problems. So I would never actually use this mechanism unless the question asked us about it. We had to go through this because the question might ask you about this mechanism. Okay. But this is not a mechanism I would use normally. Normally, if I see a per acid, I'm just going to just draw the epoxide. There's not any extra insight that I think we're getting out of this mechanism. We just need to know it in case we're asked about it. Okay. So far, so good? Yes. Let's draw the product of this reaction. Whoops. I meant to draw this. Let's draw the product of this reaction. And we were just talking about the fact that it's not necessary to go through the whole mechanism. We'll just draw the product. recognize that we have an alkene and a per acid. How do we know this is a per acid? Because the two oxygens are bound to each other here. That's unusual to have two oxygens in a peroxy group that are bound to each other. So we're going to form a epoxide. This is the simpler case where we started with a cyclic alkene. We said that when we start with a cyclic alkene, we can simply put the epoxide oxygen on wedges or dashes. By the way, it's also possible there might be a second product when the oxygen comes in from behind. But I think we can see that's just going to be a duplicate of this in this case. If the oxygen came in from behind, that would really be the same as this product. I don't think your instructor is too interested, maybe, in the fact that there's sometimes possibly two products. We won't spend too much time on this. But in this case, there's definitely just one product.
This is a little trickier because this is an acyclic cyclic alkene. And we've seen that the, the correct way to draw the product, the epoxide product for an acyclic alkene is different than a cyclic. How's it different? Well, first of all, we saw that we should redraw this with the substituents on wedges and dashes. We saw that we should redraw this. So right now, the alkene is like this, but we're going to rotate it like this. 